Hey students, this is our last and fourth installment of our lecture for World War I. So to have them all together for this unit, there's six total lectures. There's two from our imperialism unit and then four for World War I. So I thank you for grinding, getting through all of those. Um, and I know they're about 20 to 30 minutes. So thank you for doing that. And it's kind of just the way that I'm able to get the information to you under the circumstances. So I know it's probably a lot better for you to be here in the classroom and get that information. I would appreciate that too, but I know you're doing the best uh, sitting in front of a computer, listening to me that way. And I'm trying to be as brief as possible. So here's another brief lecture. I'll try to be as quick as possible. I think it might just be about 10 minutes, just talking about the end of World War I. How does it end and what are some of the consequences? If you read our article about why World War I is important and still is important to today, you got a sense of this and how the ending of World War I really catapults us into World War II and then catapults us into the way that things are in the world nowadays. So it was the Great War and it produced a sort of a great calamity while we were fighting that war, but then the ramifications, the consequences of that war continue even 100 years later until today. Last year, we celebrated the 100 year anniversary of the ending of World War I uh in in the signing of the treaty of versailles but we still even 100 years later in 2019 2020 still have the ramifications of that war with us and so we don't necessarily have the time to get into all those details so i'll just continue on our lecture and get through the slideshow and uh and hopefully impart some wisdom to you um in, in american history and so if you remember where we ended up in last Times lecture, we were talking about the technologies and the weapons of World War I, as well as the type of warfare, the trench warfare that happens uh, in World War I. And so we ended up talking about the U-boat, which is probably one of the greatest technological advancements made. It's not the first submarine ever made. First, it wasn't by the Germans. Actually, in the Civil War, there were submarines that were made uh, by both the Union and the Confederates that we had hoped uh, would be effective at killing the other side in the American Rev American uh, Civil War, not the revolution. So it's not the first time, but becomes the most effective use of underwater warfare, submarine warfare is what the Germans produce. Um, so we talked about that again, look up. It's interesting little tidbits uh, in American history, which is why I love teaching it because I'm always learning about it. And you guys are always teaching me things too, which I appreciate. So anyways, World War I basically slowly dribbles down to an end. Okay, America joins in 1917. We offer a fresh million troops to come and fight and basically tip the scales against the Germans. The Austro-Hungarians have kind of basically collapsed, exhausted themselves. The Ottoman Empire is still fighting, but they're losing wars to the British and the French navies. And so really what happens is when America joins, we're really fighting the Germans in the Western Front. Uh, the Russians have collapsed in the Eastern Front, and so they, the Germans have sent their forces to the Western Front, and so there's skirmishes back and forth, but there's really no Germans left to fight by the time the Americans come. So even though we're going to fight some pitched battles, we have to storm the trenches, and we have to push the Germans back, and we have a couple of uh, pretty incredible battles that we fight, uh, and some deadly ones too, like the Battle of Bellow Woods, uh, which we won't have a chance to get into. We basically exhaust the German army and through this war of attrition. They have no one left to fight. And so because they're exhausted, because they can't go on, we bring them to sort of the ceasefire table uh, or the table of victory really for America and for Britain, for France. And so by uh, November 11th, this is the 11th month and the 11th day, and it happened at the 11th hour in 1918. So at 11 a.m., there was a ceasefire that took place. So we're, both sides are not gonna be fighting each other, shooting at each other anymore. And it did, was signed, it was carried out. And so we did have a ceasefire after the four year sort of beginning of World War I, it finally falls silent. Uh, in Europe and the rest of the world. So this is what was originally celebrated every year as Armistice Day from 1919 to 1920 and every year on until we get to 
World War II. And then Armistice Day doesn't have the same significance because we have victories over Japan, victories over Germany, and World War II, which kind of overshadow Armistice Day, with, which is the ceasefire in World War I. But we still, we've uh, sort of recalibrated November 11th to not be Armistice Day. Now it's Veterans Day where we honor those uh, men and women who have served our country in uniform and have survived and come back to America. So that's what we call Veterans Day and why we celebrate Veterans Day on November 11th. Many other countries still celebrate Armistice Day and they call it Armistice Day like France and Britain. Uh, they keep that tradition of World War I because it was such a devastating war for them. They don't wanna forget that. And then they also have their remembrances for World War II as well, of course. And so what comes out of this ceasefire is Woodrow Wilson, our president at the time, uh, there comes a couple of months after the ceasefire is over was, you know, what is going to be decided to conclude this war? That's going to happen at a place in France called the Palace of Versailles, in which all the world leaders are going to come and sit there and sort of hash out what do the winners get, what do the losers get? In the meantime, before that conference takes place, Wilson is going to give a speech that is called the 14 point speech. He's going to give 14 points or 14 things that needs to happen to bring the world back into a peaceful situation and guarantee peace, uh, basically eternal forever, which we know is not going to happen. And all 14 of his points are going to be taken seriously. A couple of them are, but not all of them. So his goal was number one, to avoid another war. Number two, he's going to avoid the wants to avoid the spread of communism, which is now rooted in Russia, which is now calling itself the Soviet Union and not trying to let it spread. And then number three, he wants to rebuild Europe so that European countries don't continue to go at each other. And so some of these taken very serious, like stopping the spread of communism, and then others not so much, avoiding another war, rebuilding Europe. Um, so we descend into another war within 25 years. So were his 14 points really taken serious? A lot of historians say no. If they were, would we be in another war? Who knows? It's kind of, again, historian's big conundrum. So his main points, as he says, we need to adjust the borders of countries so we don't have huge countries like Austria-Hungary, two kingdoms ruling over all these subgroups and populations. So we need the Slavics people to divide themselves up which is kind of what we see now with uh, Bosnia and Serbia. And, uh, so we have all these different, uh, Albania, Bulgaria, all these different groups uh, ruling over themselves instead of huge conglomeration countries ruling over all these smaller ethnic groups, which creates tension and problems in the first place. Number two, he said, we need to create what was called the League of Nations. And the League of Nations is supposed to be a collection of every country, representatives from every country that can talk out their issues so we don't box out each other in the issues we have and fight against each other. And so League of Nations is created. And then in the great irony, our United States Senate doesn't uh, approve of the League of Nations. And so America doesn't get involved in the League of Nations, which uh, kind of undercuts some of the authority that the League of Nations has. So we're going to improve upon that after World War II and say, now we can't have World War III. So we improve upon the League of Nations and call it the United Nations. And then America is definitely a part of it. In fact, we host it in New York City. That's the headquarters for the United Nations. And then number three, Wilson said, we need to limit the size and weapons of every country's armies to guarantee that countries don't have huge armies that want to go to war. And then number five, we need to change the colonial system by giving colonies a vote for independence so they can declare their independence from the mother countries if they want to and need to. Um, and so those are the main points. Uh, some of them, again, taken serious, some of them not. Um, and, and even Wilson couldn't come back to the United States and convince the Senate that we need to be a part of the League of Nations. So him and his great idealism couldn't uh, even make it practical uh, for the American Senate. So uh, but what does end up following a couple months later is this big conference uh, in Versailles, France. This is where the kings have historically lived in France and ruled from is in the city of Versailles. There's a huge palace complex there. You can still go see. Maybe some of you have. It's pretty amazing. I'm, it's on my bucket list to get there. Uh, but from this place, they make the Treaty of Versailles of 1919, where they decide who the winners are and what they get, who the losers are, and what they have to give up. And the treaty was only chaired by the winners, England and France. America's going to be there. Japan's going to be there. Uh, and, and Germany's not even going to be allowed to be there. 
Uh, so they are going to be told kind of what they have to do and have to give up. So it's only chaired by the winners and the winners, especially England and France have shed a lot of blood. They want revenge. This is their chance to kind of get even with Germany for kind of starting World War I. And so Germany and Austria are both not allowed to voice in the treaty. And then Russia and the U.S. didn't sign the treaty themselves. Wilson said, hey, this is going to undercut uh, really relations in Europe and it's going to bring about World War II and he kind of foreshadowed that and then Russia was a communist country they didn't want any part of uh, any of these capitalistic countries that they thought were uh, a part of the old world order when they're a part of the new world order so very interesting dynamics but it's going to lead us into what historians essentially call the terms of the Treaty of Versailles as the rape of Germany, because really everything was stripped from Germany at the end of World War I. Number one, they had to accept responsibility for the war. So even though it's going to be fought by many uh, countries, many millions of men, uh, it's, Germany's going to have to be sole sort of responsible for the war, which is really uh, not their fault. Um, and can't necessarily all blame pinned on them. Uh, then Germany was forced to pay $5 billion by 1921. So they had two years to make a $5 billion payment, which was a, an incredible amount of money at that time, especially being a war-torn country. And then they had to pay $33 billion over time. They finished their last payment about six years ago. Um, so Germany was still paying on that. They didn't pay during World War II or during Nazi uh, Germany times, but uh, number three, Germany had to lose all their colonies, and the colonies were divided up by the winners, both colonies in Africa, colonies in Asia, uh, had to give them all up, and also in the Middle East, too, in the North Africa. Uh, and then they're going to lose the land of France, Belgium, and Poland, uh, in which they're going to try to gain back. Uh, in the lead up to World War II, Hitler's gonna start reclaiming a lot of those territories and say they're historically a part of Germany, I'm just gonna take them again. And we allowed them as leaders of the world for him to do that. And then number five, uh, Germany could not have a draft. They could not have an offensive military. Okay, so their entire military was destroyed. They could only have a police force that would operate in defense if they were ever attacked by another country. So really terms that really uh, sort of uh, devastated Germany and really tore the heart out and hopefully is gonna see why it's gonna lead into World War II because they're gonna be utterly devastated both economically, militarily, uh, they're gonna lose land and territory. And so all this taken from them. So what are they gonna to look to is someone that says, hey, I'm gonna come and restore the ancient German land. I'm gonna restore ancient German race and get rid of all these you know, subversives that are out there. I'm gonna come and make our military strong again. We're gonna be the most powerful military in the world. I'm gonna give us everyone a job. So even though we're in the worst economic uh, depression in world history, I'm gonna give everyone a job to make weapons and ammunition, but everyone gets a job. And so hopefully you see why the German people, not largely, but there's gonna be a, a growing sort of minority of people that are going to look to, you know, a crazed madman that we know, Adolf Hitler, who's going to come to power and take over Germany and then start taking over and start World War II. That's going to be the result, really, of the end of World War I. One historian has said the last shot fired in World War I became the first shot fired in World War II, and that really does become true because of the effects of what happens in the Treaty of Versailles, the ending of World War I. So here's Germany in, in <clears throat> what it used to be. Sort of you see uh, it used to be all this red. They're going to lose this green part too. Uh, and so Germany really shrinks. This is Austria-Hungary in the blue, uh, which also be, uh, used to be Austria, but it gets carved up into separate countries. And then Bulgaria is going to lose land that's here in yellow. And then all of this right here is going to be lost by the Russians to create their own new countries as well. What's interesting is that as World War II gets started, Germany is going to want to reconquer all of the portions, all the red areas that they lost in the green area. And then they're going to even make their way into Austria and make their way into the Rhineland, which is right here. So Hitler's goal is going to be to reclaim what used to be theirs before 
World War One and during World War One, kind of the same thing with Russia. When Soviet Union gets involved in World War II, they're trying to reclaim all these countries, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, that was taken from them at the conclusion of World War One as well. Even though they're communists, they're still out to control all the land that they used to have. But you see all these new countries created at the end of World War One. Again, they're not going to last but 25 years before Russia is going to come from the east, Germany is going to come from the west and try to reconquer many of these areas and try to retake them over again. Now they are, for the most part, their own countries again today at the conclusion of World War II, uh, but the map is going to shift significantly throughout the 1900s through World War I and World War II. And then the League of Nations, uh, again, is this goal of all the countries are sending representatives to talk out their issues so there's never war again. The goal is to create world peace and cooperation. It was President Wilson's idea from his 14 point speech. And again, he takes it to Congress and champions, hey, we need to pass this. But he wasn't able to prove how American support was gonna help us as a country and help our influence in the rest of the world. And so the Senate was very skeptical of us being pulled into another war uh, started by other European powers. If you remember, America want to be isolationist. We want to be set apart through the Monroe Doctrine. Let Europe do what it's going to do. We're going to do what we want to do. And so there's still this mentality of we are drug into this war. We had a million men fight. We had 300,000 casualties in this war. We paid a tremendous price. We help secure our future and the future of the world, but we don't want to involve ourselves in anything crazy big like that again. That is your problem if you start that. And so there's this feeling that like this cartoon, Uncle Sam is going to be pulled in all these other directions by these other European countries and powers to do kind of their will. And so that is why Congress, especially the Senate, did not approve uh, of America being a part of the League of Nations. Uh, and ultimately, it's going to be one of the reasons why it fails is because the great visionary Wilson who had this idea, uh, you know, wasn't able to get the Congress to support it and is one of the reasons why this fails. So, but as soldiers return after the war is over, they're going to have the heroes welcome. We helped win the war. Again, we didn't start it, but we're going to finish it, America. Uh, but soldiers are going to return to jobs being scarce. African-American soldiers who are going to be fighting in World War One and and are going to be very courageous um, and even though they're going to fight in segregated units are going to content, uh, return back to being a second class citizen especially in the southern united states unfortunately and we won't see that really changed even through world war ii uh, but after uh, world war ii things are going to start to change and we're going to desegregate the military and armed forces so for soldiers, it's going to be the sense of gloom and disillusionment. Soldiers are going to ex have experienced shell shock, not all of them, but many of them. And uh, it's what we call PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder now, where they experience war, something traumatic, and then they continue to relive it through dreams or uh, nightmares or uh, through other experiences uh, in life and kind of dis disables them, right? And so, but they call it shell shock at the time. And so... Uh, this doesn't last long, uh, but this generation is called the lost generation because they feel kind of like they lost their innocence. They lost uh, sort of the will to move on from World War I. But what does move on in World War II, or excuse me, World War I is the 1920s, which is at this time in the 1920s, the most successful time in American history and a tremendous proud, proud time to be an American. And there's going to be specific decades where it's great to be an American, 1920s, 1950s, you could say the 1980s uh, are kind of a, a moment like that too. Uh, but we're going to go straight from World War I into the 1920s, which we call the Roaring Twenties, because of uh, sort of the cool things and prosperity that happens in that decade, which is where our next unit is going to go. And so... The cost of war, which you don't need to necessarily remember, but in human figures, just to understand the magnitude of how big this event was, is 9 million men in uniform are going to be killed of all the countries involved, 9 million civilians also killed, okay, just being sort of a collateral damage in this war. 22 million people are going to be wounded, and then this war is going to cost $186 billion, direct cost of the war which is trillions of dollars in today's money, uh, and then there's going to be indirect costs 
uh, of the war as, as well. And then I had figures, uh, sort of the men mobilized, the men that go to war, and then how many of those men die, how many are wounded or be prisoners or missing, so how many are casualties. And so you see like Russia mobilized 12 million men to fight. Well, 76% of those men become dead, wounded, or missing through fighting. So this is one of the reasons they're going to bear such a huge burden and so why their government collapses and installs communism and they have a communist revolution there. Uh, but again, France, you see huge high numbers, dead, wounded, or missing, 73% of those involved. Uh, so this is the allied powers. Where's the United States? Well, we mobilized 4.3 million men, you know, 126,000 wounded, 234 wounded. So only 8% of all the men that we sent become a casualty. Very low because we were only in the war for such a short time. And again, we help win the war and bring about the end of it. So Britain, 36%, Italy, 39%. So this is a tremendously high number. I'm not trying to discount it, but we're talking about millions of men dying, perishing, or wounded, or prisoners, or missing. Where's Germany? Well, 65% of the men that they mobilized and sent to war became a casualty. Austria-Hungary, tremendously higher, 90% which is why they basically collapse before the war is over as well. So, okay, so that ends sort of our slideshow, our lecture it took 20 minutes. Uh, so a bit longer than I wanted to, I get like long-winded, but thanks for watching. And that wraps up imperialism and World War I unit and uh, get ready for our, our assessment on it. Thanks you guys.